a tip had been received that important documents might be found in Gehring's hunting lodge near Bad Reichenau. Roger Barrett and I were dispatched to take a look. We were met at the door by Frau Gehring, who very politely gave permission to search. <coughs> we searched the house from stem to gudgeon, and what we found in the attic was great hordes of cases of cognac and French champagne, <laughs> Cuban cigars, and Lucky Strike Green cigarettes. Remember, Lucky Strike Green had gone to war, which unfortunately were evidence of nothing but Mr. Goering's acquisitive gluttony. Also, my father was concerned about delays in the proceedings if all the questions and answers and arguments had to be translated consecutively in three other languages. He had heard of experiments in simultaneous translation carried on at the League of Nations in Geneva. I was sent to Geneva to reconnoiter. And while there, I was referred to Washington. In, in Washington, I explained the problem to Charlie Horsky, who was in charge of the prosecution's Washington office. Charlie took it up with IBM, and the rest is history. A simultaneous translation system with skilled staff was in place at the opening of trial, without which the trial would have taken at least three or four times as long. From time to time during the course of the trial, I also carried messages from my father, President Truman, mostly regarding difficulties with the Soviets, which my father thought the President should be aware of in the conduct of U.S. foreign policy during the beginning of the Cold War. My father also flattered me by consulting me on questions of policy and strategy. What did I think of his disagreement with General Donovan with regard to whether the evidence should be based on the testimony of witnesses or on documents? Not surprisingly, I agreed with his position that documents were a firmer foundation. You can't cross-examine a document. What about proposals for plea bargains? There were several such proposals, the principal one involving caring and shock. General Donovan had a German lawyer named Leverkuhn from Hamburg come to Nuremberg. This lawyer communicated between the general and the Germans' defendants' counsel. In that way, a proposition came to my father that Schacht would testify against Goering. Goering, we knew, was ready to testify against Schacht. <laughs> Goering wanted an understanding that if he was convicted, he would be shot and not hanged. He candidly, at that stage, didn't see much chance of his escape. <clears throat> Donovan's idea was that Schock should be permitted to testify against Gary, and in that way, work himself out of the case if he could. My father didn't feel that we should have any bargains with any <coughs> defendants. He thought we had evidence enough to convict them without it. He thought that any bargain by which we use any one of them to convict the other would always give the impression of a deal back of the scenes and would raise questions as to the integrity of the process. My, my father preferred that some get away, if they were going to get away, without any bargains about it. So he turned down the proposition of a deal. 
Um, now, let me turn to the preparation of my father's <coughs> opening the address to the <coughs> tribunal, about which you heard earlier today. I think it's fair to say that my father was one of the best educated public servants of his generation. And this was largely the result of self-education. He read avidly and widely the Bible, Shakespeare, other classics, and he practiced Emerson's ideal of self-reliance. Throughout his career as Assistant Attorney General, Solicitor General, Attorney General and Justice, he never used a ghostwriter. Though he relied on his staff for help in checking facts and law, in which I played a small part, the ideas was, were of his own creation. And he always wrote his own stuff with yellow pad and pencil or by dictation, followed by drafting and redrafting. His method and his problems are best revealed in his own words, as set forth in his memoir given to the Columbia University Oral History Project. And now I'm quoting from his memoir. The prosecutors had agreed on the division of the case and on the order of presentation. The Americans were to open the overall case on conspiracy at the beginning of the trial. That put considerable burden on us because it required us to be the earliest ready with the biggest portion of the case. The British would make an opening speech and follow with the presentation of their evidence, then the French, and then the Soviets. This order and arrangement had been agreed to at Berlin by the chief prosecutors. So the task that immediately fell to me was to prepare the opening speech which I would deliver and to get the evidence arranged for presentation in the following weeks to support my opening remarks. I turned to the task of writing the speech. It involved some physical difficulty. For one thing, there was a constant and unremitting interruption with administrative troubles, ranging from trivial ones to most serious ones, and ne necessitating conferences and all sorts of things that diverted your attention and absorbed your energies. My system of operating was to go to the office in the morning in the Palace of Justice, hold such conferences as were necessary with staff people during the day, and work on the speech in the evening. It seemed almost impossible to get free daytime for that kind of work. 